Epistle Dedicatory of the Rape of the Lock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope. Epistle Dedicatory. To Mrs. Arabella Firmer. Madam, it will be in vain to deny that I have some regard for this piece, since I dedicate it to you. Yet you may bear me witness it was intended only to divert a few young ladies, who have good sense and good humor enough to laugh not only at their sex's little unguarded follies, but at their own. But as it was communicated with the air of a secret, it soon found its way into the world. An imperfect copy having been offered to a bookseller, you had the good nature for my sake to consent to the publication of one more correct. This I was forced to before I had executed half of my design, for the machinery was entirely wanting to complete it. The machinery, madam, is a term invented by the critics to signify that part which the deities, angels, or demons are made to act in a poem, for the ancient poets are in one respect like many modern ladies. Let an action be never so trivial in itself, they always make it appear of the utmost importance. These machines I determined to raise on a very new and odd foundation, the Rosicrucian Doctrine of Spirits. I know how disagreeable it is to make use of hard words before a lady, but it is so much the concern of a poet to have his works understood, and particularly by your sex, that you must give me leave to explain two or three difficult terms. The Rosicrucians are a people I must bring you acquainted with. The best account I know for them is in a French book called Le Comme de Gabalie which both in its title and size is so like a novel that many of the fair sex have read it for one by mistake. According to these gentlemen, the four elements are inhabited by spirits, which they call sylphs, gnomes, nymphs, and salamanders. The gnomes, or demons of earth, delight in mischief, but the sylphs, whose habitation is in the air, are the best-conditioned creatures imaginable. For they say, any mortal may enjoy the most intimate familiarities with these gentle spirits, upon a condition very easy to all true adepts, an inviolate preservation of chastity. As to the following cantos, all the passages of them are as fabulous as the vision at the beginning, or the transformation at the end, except the loss of your hair which I always mention with reverence. The human persons are as fictitious as the airy ones, and the character of Belinda, as it is now managed, resembles you in nothing but in beauty. If this poem has as many graces as there are in your person or in your mind, yet I could never hope it should pass through the world half so uncensured as you have done. But let its fortune be what it will, mine is happy enough to have given me this occasion of assuring you that I am, with the truest esteem, madam, your most obedient, humble servant, A. Pope. End of Epistle Dedicatory Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Canto One of The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What dire offence from amorous causes springs? What mighty contests rise from trivial things? I sing. This verse to carol muse is due. This even Belinda may vouchsafe to view. Slight is the subject, but not so the praise if she inspire and he approve my lays say what strange motive goddess could compel a well-bred lord to assault a gentle bell oh say what stranger cause yet unexplored could make a gentle bell reject a lord in tasks so bold can little men engage and in soft bosoms dwell such mighty rage 
Saul through white curtains shot a timorous ray, and oped those eyes that must eclipse the day. Now lapdogs give themselves the rousing shake, and sleepless lovers just at twelve awake. Thrice rung the bell, the slipper knocked the ground, and the pressed watch returned a silver sound. Belinda still her downy pillow pressed, her guardian sylph prolonged the balmy rest. Twas he had summoned to her silent bed the morning dream that hovered o'er her head. A youth more glittering than a birth-night bow, that even in slumber caused her cheek to glow, seemed to her ear his winning lips to lay, and thus in whispers said, or seemed to say, fairest of mortals thou distinguished care of thousand bright inhabitants of air if e'er one vision touch thy infant thought of all the nurse and all the priest have taught of airy elves by moonlight shadows seen the silver token and the circled green or virgins visited by angel powers with golden crowns and wreaths of heavenly flowers hear and believe thy own importance know nor bound thy narrow views to things below some secret truths from learned pride concealed to maids alone and children are revealed what though no credit doubting wits may give the fair and innocent shall still believe know then unnumbered spirits round thee fly the light militia of the lower sky these though unseen are ever on the wing hang o'er the box and hover round the ring think what an equipage thou hast in air and view with scorn two pages and a chair as now your own our beings were of old and once enclosed in woman's beauteous mould. Thence by a soft transition we repair from earthly vehicles to these of air. Think not when woman's transient breath is fled that all her vanities at once are dead. Succeeding vanities she still regards, and though she plays no more, or looks the cards, her joy in gilded chariots when alive and love of ombre after death survive for when the fair in all their pride expire to their first elements their souls retire the sprites of fiery termagants and flame mount up and take a salamander's name soft yielding minds to water glide away and sip with nymphs their elemental tea the graver prude sinks downward to a gnome in search of mischief still on earth to roam the light coquettes in sylphs aloft repair and sport and flutter in the fields of air no further yet whoever fair and chaste rejects mankind is by some sylph embraced for spirits freed from mortal laws with ease assume what sexes and what shapes they please what guards the purity of melting maids in courtly balls and midnight masquerades safe from the treacherous friend the darling spark the glance by day the whisper in the dark when kind occasion prompts their warm desires when music softens and when dancing fires tis but their sylph the wise celestials know though honour is the word with men below some nymphs there are too conscious of their face for life predestined to the gnome's embrace these swell their prospects and exalt their pride when offers are disdained and love denied then gay ideas crowd the vacant brain while peers and dukes in all their sweeping train and garters stars and coronets appear and in soft sounds your grace salutes their ear tis these that early taint the female soul 
instruct the eyes of young coquettes to roll teach infant cheeks a bidden blush to know and little hearts to flutter at a bow oft when the world imagine women stray the sylphs throw mystic mazes guide their way throw all the giddy circle they pursue and old impertinence expel by new what tender maid but must a victim fall to one man's treat but for another's ball when florio speaks what virgin could withstand if gentle damon did not squeeze her hand with varying vanities from every part they shift the moving toy-shop of their heart where wigs with wigs with sword knots sword knots strive bow banish bow and coaches coaches drive this erring mortal's levity may call o oh, blind to truth the sylphs contrive it all of these am i who thy protection claim a watchful sprite and ariel is my name late as i range the crystal wilds of air in the clear mirror of thy ruling star i saw alas some dread event impend ere to the main this morning sun descend but heaven reveals not what or how or where warned by the sylph o pious maid beware this to disclose is all thy guardian can beware of all but most beware of man he said when shock who thought she slept too long leaped up and waked his mistress with his tongue twas then belinda if report say true thy eyes first open on a billadoo wounds charms and ardours were not sooner read but all the vision vanished from thy head and now unveiled the toilet stands displayed each silver vase in mystic order laid first robed in white the nymph intent adores with head uncovered the cosmetic powers a heavenly image in the glass appears to that she bends to that her eyes she rears the inferior priestess at her altar's side trembling begins the sacred rites of pride unnumbered treasures ope at once and here the various offerings of the world appear from each she nicely culls with curious toil and decks the goddess with the glittering spoil this casket india's glowing gems unlocks and all arabia breathes from yonder box the tortoise here and elephant unite transform to combs the speckled and the white here files of pins extend their shining rows puffs powders patches bibles billet doux now awful beauty puts on all its arms the fair each moment rises in her charms repairs her smiles awakens every grace and calls forth all the wonders of her face sees by degrees a purer blush arise and keener lightnings quicken in her eyes the busy sylphs surround their darling care these set the head and those divide the hair some fold the sleeve whilst others plait the gown and betty's praised for labours not her own End of Canto One Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Canto Two of The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Not with more glories in the ethereal plain the sun first rises o'er the purpled main, then issuing forth the rival of his beams launched on the bosom of the silver thames fair nymphs and well-dressed youths around her shone but every eye was fixed on her alone on her white breast a sparkling cross she wore which jews might kiss and infidels adore her lively looks a sprightly mind disclose 
quick as her eyes and unfixed as those favors to none to all she smiles extends oft she rejects but never once offends bright as the sun her eyes the gazers strike and like the sun they shine on all alike yet graceful ease and sweetness void of pride might hide her faults if bells had faults to hide if to her share some female errors fall look on her face and you'll forget them all this nymph to the destruction of mankind nourished two locks which graceful hung behind in equal curls and well conspired to deck with shining ringlets the smooth ivory neck love in these labyrinths his slaves detains and mighty hearts are held in slender chains with hairy springes we the birds betray slight lines of hair surprise the finny prey fair tresses man's imperial race ensnare and beauty draws us with a single hair the adventurous baron the bright locks admired he saw he wished and to the prize aspired resolved to win he mediates the way by force to ravish or by fraud betray for when success a lover's toil attends few ask if fraud or force attained his ends for this ere phoebus rose he had implored propitious heaven and every power adored but chiefly love to love an altar built of twelve vast french romances neatly gilt there lay three garters half a pair of gloves and all the trophies of his former loves with tender billet doux he lights the pyre and breathes three amorous sighs to raise the fire then prostrate falls and begs with ardent eyes soon to obtain and long possess the prize the powers gave ear and granted half his prayer the rest the winds dispersed in empty air but now secure the painted vessel glides the sunbeams trembling on the floating tides while melting music steals upon the sky and softened sounds along the waters die smooth flow the waves the zephyrs gently play belinda smiled and all the world was gay all but the sylph with careful thought oppressed the appending woe sat heavy on his breast he summoned straight his denizens of air the lucid squadrons round the sails repair soft o'er the clouds the aerial whispers breathe that seemed but zephyrs to the train beneath some to the sun their insect wings unfold waft on the breeze or sink in clouds of gold transparent forms too fine for mortal sight their fluid bodies half dissolved in light loose to the wind their airy garments flew thin glittering textures of the filmy dew dipped in the richest tincture of the skies where light disports in ever mingling dyes while every beam new transient colors flings colors that change whene'er they wave their wings amid the circle on the gilded mast superior by the head was ariel placed his purple pinions opening to the sun he raised his azure wand and thus begun ye sylphs and sylphids to your chief give ear fays fairies genii elves and demons here ye know the spheres and various tasks assigned by laws eternal to the aerial kind some in the fields of purest ether play and bask and whiten in the blaze of day some guide the course of wandering orbs on high or roll the planets through the boundless sky some less refined beneath the moon's pale light pursue the stars that shoot athwart the night or suck the mists in grosser air below 
or dip their pinions in the painted bow or brew fierce tempests on the wintry main or o'er the glebe distil the kindly rain others on earth or human race preside watch all their ways and all their actions guide of these the chief the care of nations own and guard with arms divine the british throne our humbler province is to tend the fair not a less pleasing though less glorious care to save the powder from too rude a gale nor let the imprisoned essences exhale to draw fresh colours from the vernal flowers to steal from rainbows ere they drop in showers a brighter wash to curl their waving hairs assist their blushes and inspire their airs nay oft in dreams invention we bestow to change a flounce or add a furbelow this day black omens threat the brightest fair that e'er deserved a watchful spirit's care some dire disaster or by force or slight but what or where the fates have wrapped in night whether the nymph shall break diana's law or some frail china jar receive a flaw or stain her honour or her new brocade forget her prayers or miss a masquerade or lose her heart or necklace at a ball or whether heaven has doomed that shock must fall haste then ye spirits to your charge repair the fluttering fan by zephyretta's care the drops to thee brilliant we consign and momentilla let the watch be thine do thou crispissa tend her favourite lock ariel himself shall be the guard of shock to fifty chosen sylphs of special note we trust the important charge the petticoat oft we have known that sevenfold fence to fail though stiff with hoops and armed with ribs of whale form a strong line about the silver bound and guard the wide circumference around whatever spirit careless of his charge his post neglects or leaves the fair at large shall feel sharp vengeance soon or take his sins be stopped in vials or transfixed with pins or plunged in lakes of bitter washes lie or wedged whole ages in a bodkin's eye gums and pomatums shall his flight retrain while clogged he beats his silken wings in vain or alums styptics with contracting power shrink his thin essence like a rivelled flower or as ixion fixed the wretch shall feel the giddy motion of the whirling mill in fumes of burning chocolate shall glow and tremble at the sea that froths below he spoke the spirits from the sails descend some orb in orb around the nymph extend some thread the mazy ringlets of her hair some hang upon the pendants of her ear with beating hearts the dire event they wait anxious and trembling for the birth of fate end of canto two recording by rhonda fetterman Canto three of the Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Close by those meads, forever crowned with flowers, where Thames with pride surveys his rising towers, there stands a structure of majestic frame, which from the neighboring Hampton takes its name. Here Britain statesmen off the fall for doom of foreign tyrants and of nymphs at home hear thou great anna whom three realms obey dost sometimes counsel take and sometimes tea hither the heroes and the nymphs resort to taste awhile the pleasures of a court in various talk the instructive hours they passed who gave the ball or paid the visit last 
one speaks the glory of the british queen and one describes a charming indian screen a third interprets motions looks and eyes at every word a reputation dies snuff or the fan supply each pause of chat with singing laughing ogling and all that meanwhile declining from the noon of day the sun obliquely shoots his burning ray the hungry judges soon the sentence sign and wretches hang that jurymen may dine the merchant from the exchange returns in peace and the long labors of the toilet cease belinda now whom thirst of fame invites burns to encounter two adventurous knights at ombre singly to decide their doom and swells her breast with conquests yet to come straight the three bands prepare in arms to join each band the number of the sacred nine soon as she spreads her hand the ethereal guard descend and sit on each important card first ariel perched upon a matador then each according to the rank they bore for sylphs yet mindful of their ancient race are as when women wondrous fond of place behold four kings in majesty revered with hoary whiskers and a forky beard and four fair queens whose hands sustain a flower the expressive emblem of their softer power four knaves in garbs succinct a trusty band caps on their heads and halberts in their hand and party-colored troops a shining train draw forth to combat on the velvet plain the skilful nymph reviews her force with care let spades be trumps she said and trumps they were now move to war her sable matadors in show like leaders of the swarthy moors spadillo first unconquerable lord led off two captive trumps and swept the board as many more manilio forced to yield and marched a victor from the verdant field him basto followed but his fate more hard gained but one trump and one plebeian card with his broad sabre next a chief in years the hoary majesty of spades appears puts forth one manly leg to sight revealed the rest his many-colored robe concealed the rebel knave who dares his prince engage proves the just victim of his royal rage even mighty pam that kings and queens are through and mowed down armies in the fights of loo sad chance of war now destitute of aid falls undistinguished by the victor's spade thus far both armies to belinda yield now to the barren fate inclines the field his warlike amazon her host invades the imperial consort of the crown of spades the club's black tyrant first her victim died spite of his haughty mane and barbarous pride what boots the regal circle on his head his giant limbs in state unwieldy spread that long behind he trails his pompous robe and of all monarchs only grasps the globe the baron now his diamonds pour apace the embroidered king who shows but half his face and his refulgent queen with powers combined of broken troops an easy conquest find clubs diamonds hearts in wild disorder seen with throngs promiscuous strew the level green thus when dispersed a routed army runs of asia's troops and afric's sable sons with like confusion different nations fly of various habit and of various die the pierced battalions disunited fall in heaps on heaps one fate o'erwhelms them all the knave of diamonds tries his wily arts and wins o oh shameful chance the queen of hearts 
at this the blood the virgin's cheek forsook a livid paleness spreads o'er all her look she sees and trembles at the approaching ill just in the jaws of ruin and codile and now as oft in some distempered state on one nice trick depends the general fate an ace of hearts steps forth the king unseen lurked in her hand and mourned his captive queen he springs to vengeance with an eager pace and falls like thunder on the prostrate ace the nymph exulting fills with shouts the sky the walls the woods and long canals reply o oh, thoughtless mortals ever blind to fate too soon dejected and too soon elate sudden these honors shall be snatched away and cursed for ever this victorious day for lo the board with cups and spoons is crowned the berries crackle and the mill turns round on shining altars of japan they raise the silver lamp the fiery spirits blaze from silver spouts the grateful liquors glide while china's earth receives the smoking tide at once they gratify their scent and taste and frequent cups prolong the rich repast straight hover round the fair her airy bank some as she sip the fuming liquor fanned some o'er her lap their careful plumes displayed trembling and conscious of the rich brocade coffee which makes the politician wise and see through all things with his half-shut eyes sent up in vapours to the baron's brain new stratagems the radiant lock to gain ah cease rash youth desist ere tis too late fear the just gods and think of scylla's fate changed to a bird and sent to flit in air she dearly pays for nisus's injured hair but when to mischief mortals bend their will how soon they find fit instruments of ill just then clarissa drew with tempting grace a two-edged weapon from her shining case so ladies in romance assist their knight present the spear and arm him for the fight he takes the gift with reverence and extends the little engine on his fingers ends this just behind belinda's neck he spread as o'er the fragment steams she bends her head swift to the lock a thousand sprites repair a thousand wings by turns blow back the hair and thrice they twitched the diamond in her ear thrice she looked back and thrice the foe drew near just at that instant anxious ariel sought the close recesses of the virgin's thought as on the nosegay in her breast reclined he watched the ideas rising in her mind sudden he viewed in spite of all her art an earthly lover lurking at her heart amazed confused he found his power expired resigned to fate and with a sigh retired the peer now spreads the glittering forfex wide to enclose the lock now joins it to divide even then before the fatal engine closed a wretched sylph too fondly interposed fate urged the shears and cut the sylph in twain but airy substance soon unites again the meeting points the sacred hair dissever from the fair head for ever and for ever then flash the living lightning from her eyes and screams of horror rend the affrighted skies not louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast when husbands or when lapdogs breathe their last or when rich china vessels fallen from high in glittering dust and painted fragments lie let wreaths of triumph now my temples twine the victor cried the glorious prize is mine 
while fish in streams or birds delight in air or in a coach and six the british fair as long as atlantis shall be red or the small pillow grace a lady's bed while visits shall be paid on solemn days when numerous wax lights in bright order blaze while nymphs take treats or assignations give so long my honour name and praise shall live what time would spare from steel receives its date and monuments like men submit to fate steel could the labour of the gods destroy and strike to dust the imperial towers of troy steel could the works of mortal pride confound and hew triumphal arches to the ground what wonder then fair nymph thy hair should feel the conquering force of unresisted steel end of canto three recording by rhonda fetterman canto four of the rape of the lock by alexander pope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But anxious cares the pensive nymph oppressed, And secret passions labored in her breast. Not youthful kings in battle seized alive, Not scornful virgins who their charms survive, Not ardent lovers robbed of all their bliss, Not ancient ladies when refused a kiss not tyrants fierce that unrepenting die not cynthia when her mantua's pinned awry ever felt such rage resentment and despair as thou sad virgin for thy ravished hair for that sad moment when the sylphs withdrew and ariel weeping from belinda flew umbriel a dusky melancholy sprite as ever sullied the fair face of light down to the central earth his proper scene repaired to search the gloomy cave of spleen swift on his sooty pinions flits the gnome and in a vapour reach the dismal dome no cheerful breeze this sullen region knows the dreaded east is all the wind that blows here in a grotto sheltered close from air and screened in shades from day's detested glare she sighs for ever on her pensive bed pain at her side and megrim at her head two handmaids wait the throne alike in place but differing far in figure and in face here stood ill nature like an ancient maid her wrinkled form in black and white arrayed with store of prayers for mornings nights and noons her hand is filled her bosom with lampoons there affectation with a sickly mien shows in her cheek the roses of eighteen practice to lisp and hang the head aside faints into airs and languishes with pride on the rich quilt sinks with becoming woe wrapped in a gown for sickness and for show the fair ones feel such maladies as these when each new night-dress gives a new disease a constant vapour o'er the palace flies strange phantoms rising as the mists arise dreadful as hermits dreams in haunted shades or bright as visions of expiring maids now glaring fiends and snakes on rolling spires pale spectres gaping tombs and purple fires now lakes of liquid gold elysian scenes and crystal domes and angels in machines unnumbered throngs on every side are seen of bodies changed to various forms by spleen here living teapots stand one arm held out one bent the handle this and that the spout a pipkin there like homer's tripod walks here sighs a jar and there a goose pie talks men prove with child as powerful fancy works 
and maids turned bottles call aloud for corks safe past the gnome through this fantastic band a branch of healing spleenwort in his hand then thus addressed the power hail wayward queen who rule the sex to fifty from fifteen parent of vapours and of female wit who give the hysteric or poetic fit on various tempers act by various ways make some take physic others scribble plays who cause the proud their visits to delay and send the godly in a pet to pray a nymph there is that all your power disdains and thousands more in equal mirth maintains but oh if e'er thy gnome could spoil a grace or raise a pimple on a beauteous face like citron waters matrons cheeks in flame or change complexions at a losing game if e'er with airy horns i planted heads or rumpled petticoats or tumbled beds or caused suspicion when no soul was rude or discomposed the headdress of a prude or e'er to costive lapdog gave disease which not the tears of brightest eyes could ease hear me and touch belinda with chagrin that single act gives half the world the spleen the goddess with a discontented air seems to reject him though she grants his prayer a wondrous bag with both her hands she binds like that where once ulysses held the winds there she collects the force of female lungs sighs sobs and passions and the war of tongues a vial next she fills with fainting fears soft sorrows melting griefs and flowing tears the gnome rejoicing bears her gifts away spreads his black wings and slowly mounts to day sunk in philestri's arms the nymph he found her eyes dejected and her hair unbound full o'er their heads the swelling bag he rent and all the furies issued at the vent belinda burns with more than mortal ire and fierce thalestres fans the rising fire o oh, wretched maid she spread her hands and cried while hampton's echoes wretched maid replied was it for this you took such constant care the bodkin comb and essence to prepare for this your locks in paper durance bound for this with torturing irons wreathed around for this with fillets strained your tender head and bravely bore the double loads of lead gods shall the ravisher display your hair while the fops envy and the ladies stare honour forbid at whose unrivalled shrine ease pleasure virtue all our sex resign methinks already i your tears survey already hear the horrid things they say already see you a degraded toast and all your honour in a whisper lost how shall i then your hapless fame defend twill then be infamy to seem your friend and shall this prize this inestimable prize exposed through crystal to the gazing eyes and heightened by the diamond circling rays on that rapacious hand for ever blaze sooner shall grass in hyde park circus grow and wits take lodgings in the sound of bow sooner let earth air sea to chaos fall men monkeys lapdogs parrots perish all she said then raging to sir plume repairs and bids her beau demand the precious hairs sir plume of amber snuff-box justly vain and the nice conduct of a clouded cane with earnest eyes and round unthinking face he first the snuff-box opened then the case and thus broke out my lord why what the devil zads damn the lock for god you must be civil plague on it 
tis past a jest nay prithee pox give her the hair he spoke and wrapped his box it grieves me much replied the peer again who speaks so well should ever speak in vain but by this lock this sacred lock i swear which never more shall join its parted hair which never more its honours shall renew clipped from the lovely head where late it grew that while my nostrils draw the vital air this hand which won it shall for ever wear he spoke and speaking in proud triumph spread the long contended honours of her head but umbriel hateful gnome forbears not so he breaks the vial whence the sorrows flow then see the nymph in beauteous grief appears her eyes half languishing half drowned in tears on her heavy bosom hung her drooping head which with a sigh she raised and thus she said for ever cursed be this detested day which snatched my best my favourite curl away happy ah ten times happy had i been if hampton court these eyes had never seen yet am not i the first mistaken maid by love of courts too numerous ills betrayed oh had i rather unadmired remained in some lone isle or distant northern land where the gilt chariot never marks the way where none learn ombre none e'er taste bohe there kept my charms concealed from mortal eye like roses that in deserts bloom and die what moved my mind with youthful lords to roam oh had i stayed and said my prayers at home twas this morning omen seemed to tell thrice from my trembling hand the patch-box fell the tottering china shook without a wind nay pole sat mute and shock was most unkind a sylph too warned me of the threats of fate in mystic visions now believed too late see the poor remnants of these slighted hairs my hand shall rend what even thy rapine spares these into sable ringlets taught to break once gave new beauties to the snowy neck the sister lock now sits uncouth alone and in its fellows fate foresees its own uncurled it hangs the fatal shears demands and tempts one more thy sacrilegious hands o oh, hadst thou cruel been content to seize hairs less in sight or any hairs but these end of canto four recording by rhonda fetterman canto five of the rape of the lock by alexander pope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. She said, The pitying audience melt in tears, But fate and Jove had stopped the baron's ears. In vain Thalestri's with reproach assails, For who can move when fair Belinda fails? Not half so fixed the Trojan could remain, While Anna begged and Dido raged in vain then grave clarissa graceful waved her fan silence ensued and thus the nymph began say why are beauties praised and honoured most the wise man's passion and the vain man's toast why decked with all that land and sea afford why angels called and angel-like adored why round our coaches crowd the white-gloved bows why bows the side-box from its inmost rose? How vain are all these glories, all our pains, Unless good sense preserve what beauty gains? That men may say, when we the front box grace, Behold the first in virtue as in face. Oh, if to dance all night and dress all day, Charm the small-pox or chaste old age away, 
who would not scorn what housewives' cares produce, or who would learn one earthly thing of use? To patch, nay, ogle might become a saint, nor could it sure be such a sin to paint. But since, alas, frail beauty must decay, curled or uncurled, since locks will turn to grey, since painted or not painted all shall fade, and she who scorns a man must die a maid. What then remains but well our power to use, and keep good humour still what e'er we lose? And trust me, dear, good humour can prevail, when airs and flights and screams and scolding fail. Beauties in vain their pretty eyes may roll, charms strike the sight, but merit wins the soul. So spoke the dame, but no applause ensued. Belinda frowned. Thalestres called her prude. To arms, to arms, the fierce Farrago cries, and swift as lightning to the combat flies. All side in parties, and begin the attack. Fans clap, silks rustle, and tough whalebones crack. Heroes and heroines, shouts confusedly rise and bass and treble voices strike the skies. No common weapons in their hands are found. Like gods they fight, nor dread a mortal wound. So when bold Homer makes the gods engage, and heavenly breasts with human passions rage, gainst Pallas, Mars, Latona, Hermes' arms, and all Olympus rings with loud alarms, Jove's thunder roars, heaven trembles all around, blue Neptune's storms and bell-winged deeps resound. Earth shakes her nodding towers, the ground gives way, and the pale ghosts start at the flash of day. Triumphant Umbriel, on a sconce's height, clapped his glad wings and sat to view the fight. Propped on their botkin spears, the sprites survey the growing combat, or assist the fray. While throw the press in rage the Lestries flies, and scatters death around them both her eyes. A bow and whittling perished in the throng, one died in metaphor, and one in song. O cruel nymph, a living death I bear, cried dapper wit, and sunk beside his chair. A mournful glance Sir Fopling upwards cast. Those eyes are made so killing, was his last. Thus on Meander's flowery margin lies the expiring swan, and as he sings he dies. When bold Sir Plume had drawn Clarissa down, Chloe stepped in, and killed him with a frown. She smiled to see the doughty hero slain, but at her smile the bow revived again. Now Jove suspends his golden scales in air, weighs the men's wits against the lady's hair. The doubtful beam long nods from side to side. At length the wits mount up, the hairs subside. See fierce Belinda on the barren flies, with more than usual lightning in her eyes. Nor feared the chief the unequal fight to try, who sought no more than on his foe to die. But this bold lord, with manly strength endued, she with one finger and a thumb subdued, just where the breath of life his nostrils drew, a charge of snuff the wily virgin threw. The gnomes direct to every atom just, the pungent grains of titillating dust. Sudden with starting tears each eye o'erflows, and the high dome re-echoes to his nose. Now meet thy fate, incensed Belinda cried, and drew a deadly bodkin from her side. The same his ancient personage to deck, her great-great-grandsire wore about his neck, in three seal rings, which after melted down, formed a vast buckle for his widow's gown. Her infant grandam's whistle, next it grew, 
the bell she jingled and the whistle blew then in a bodkin graced her mother's hairs which long she wore and now belinda wears boast not my fall he cried insulting foe thou by some other shalt be laid as low nor think to die dejects my lofty mind all that i dread is leaving you behind rather than so ah let me still survive and burn in cupid's flames but burn alive restore the lock she cries and all around restore the lock the vaulted roofs rebound not fierce othello in so loud a strain roared for the handkerchief that caused his pain but see how oft ambitious aims are crossed and chiefs contend till all the prize is lost the lock obtained with guilt and kept with pain in every place is sought but sought in vain with such a prize no mortal must be blessed so heaven decrees with heaven who can contest some thought it mounted to the lunar sphere since all things lost on earth are treasured there there heroes wits are kept in ponderous vases and bows in snuff-boxes and tweezer cases there broken vows and death-bed alms are found and lovers hearts with ends of ribbon bound the courtier's promises and sick man's prayers the smiles of harlots and the tears of heirs cages for gnats and chains to yoke a flea dried butterflies and tomes of casuistry but trust the muse she saw it upward rise though marked by none but quick poetic eyes so rome's great founder to the heavens withdrew to proculus alone confessed in view a sudden star it shot through liquid air and drew behind a radiant trail of hair not berenice's locks first rose so bright the heavens be spangling with dishevelled light the sylphs behold it kindling as it flies and pleased pursue its progress through the skies this the beau monde shall from the mall survey and hail with music its propitious ray this the blessed lover shall for venus take and send up vows from rosamonda's lake this partridge soon shall view in cloudless skies when next he looks through galileo's eyes and hence the egregious wizard shall foredoom the fate of louis and the fall of rome then cease bright nymph to mourn thy ravished hair which adds new glory to the shining sphere not all the tresses that fair head can boast shall draw such envy as the lock you lost for after all the murders of your eye when after millions slain yourself shall die when those fair suns shall set as set they must and all those tresses shall be laid in dust this lock the muse shall consecrate to fame and midst the stars inscribe belinda's name End of Canto Five Recording by Rhonda Fetterman End of The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope